The Bain Free Radio Hour. On the podcast, the helioscopic delight of April showers bringing May flowers. Lightsabers that cut holes in the fabric of reality itself, allowing monsters to step through. Plus, we continue with our complete audiobook serialization of John Ringo's Under a Graveyard Sky. All right now. Say that again. All right now. Welcome to the Bain Free Radio Hour podcast. It's an honor to have you along. I'm Bain editor Tony Daniel, and with me is... Publishing intern Rachel Mintel. So this time we have an interview with Australian writer Dave Freer. Well, Australian, born South African. Um, as those of you who have heard Dave on the podcast before or read his blog entries know, Dave and his family live a self-sufficient life on Flinders Island off the coast of Australia between Melbourne and Tasmania. Dave talks a bit about that in an interview by way of discussing his new young adult contemporary fantasy novel. It's a wonderful offering that I urge you to check out, even if you are a long way from being a young adult these days. It's readable by everybody. It's a book for everyone. The book is called Changeling's Island, and we'll be speaking about it shortly with Dave. What else do we have, Rachel? We also continue with our complete audiobook serialization of John Ringo's Under a Graveyard Sky. Now, here's the news. April mass market flowers don't have to wait for May in these parts. They are blooming with a vengeance. Let us discuss this, Rachel. We do have some excellent mass markets coming out this month, like the Grantville Gazette, Volume 7, edited and created by Eric Flint. After a cosmic accident sets the modern West Virginia town of Grantville down in war-torn 17th century Europe, the freedom-loving and resourceful uptimers must find a way to flourish even in the mad and bloody end of the Renaissance. The Grantville Gazette, Volume 7, fills in the pieces of the alternate history series Ring of Fire's political, social, cult and cultural puzzle with stories by a range of authors. Grantville Gazette 7. And we have Trail of Evil by Travis S. Taylor, book four in the best-selling sci-fi Tossetti Agenda series. This is the sequel to One Good Soldier of the Tossetti Agenda series. Alexander Moore returns to the stars to hunt down the remnant weaponry platforms left by the brilliant, mad, artificial intelligence Copernicus. But Moore uncovers something even more sinister. Copernicus has established multiple mecha warrior defended bases intent on resuming humanity's destruction. And out now is His Father's Eyes by David B. Coe. This is book two in the case files of Justice Fearson, a contemporary fantasy series. Justice Fearson is a were-missed private detective who wields a potent magic, but on the full moon of every month, he loses his mind. In this one, Jay must fight to save the city and the people he loves from the enemy before time runs out. And finally, we have the omnibus of Tales of the Time Scouts 2 by Robert Asprin and Linda Evans. This omni includes two novels of time-traveling adventure, One's called Ripping Time, and the other is The House That Jack Built. In Ripping Time, Jenna Cadrick, the only daughter of Senator John Cadrick, is trapped in a desperate struggle to stay alive. And in The House That Jack Built, con artist Skeeter Jackson finds himself caught up in the biggest mystery of the century, London, 1888, home of Jack the Ripper. So we have The Granville Gazette, Volume 7, Trail of Evil by Travis S. Taylor, His Father's Eyes by David B. Coe, and Tales of the Time Scouts 2 by Robert Asprin and Linda Evans are available now at booksellers everywhere. I want to welcome Dave Freer back to the podcast. Hi, Dave. Hi. How are things in the foreign parts over there? Well, it's For either... Me, you're all foreign parts. <laughs> it's either later or earlier than it is for you. <laughs> Or both yeah, we get we get to see this is time travel. We get to see the world earlier than you do. Yeah. And Dave Freer is an ichthyologist turned author who lives on Flinders Island, which is between mainland Australia and Tasmania, with his wife, four dogs, four cats, and two sons. He has co authored a range of novels with Eric Flint, Rats, Bats and Vats, The Rats, the Bats and the Ugly, Pyramid Scheme, Pyramid Power 
and one of my personal favorites, Slow Trained Arcturus. And with Mercedes Lackey and Eric Flint, uh, the uh, Heirs of Alexandria series, The Shadow of the Lion, This Rough Magic, The Wizard of Carries, which is not part of that, actually. Uh, Much Fall of Blood, Burdens of the Dead. And uh, he's got a solo novel, uh, Mankind Witch, that's set in that series as well. And he is the author of the Dragon's Ring fantasy novels, Dragon's Ring and Dog and Dragon. But out now at its booksellers everywhere is Changeling's Island. This is a book you'll find in the teen section at the bookstore, at least in the U.S., but it's certainly a story everybody will like. Anybody can read this book and should. So, Dave, you sent it to Bain without the expectation we take it necessarily, yes. just to give us a shot I, at I was it. very surprised when you did because it was, to me, quite an Australian story. On the other hand, I've showed it since then to several American friends, and they say, yes, for people across a frontier culture, it rings very true. Yeah, absolutely. And it was, I mean, it blew me away when I read it. I really loved it. I mean, the sense of place was just spot on, and the magic you developed from that was... Um, was really felt authentic. And I started, when I read it, I started gushing about it to Tony Weisskopf, main publisher, and as I recall, and we, we ended up buying it, and now it's out. So Dave, Changeling Island is a contemporary fantasy set on the actual island where you live. I want to talk about the island, of course, but the book starts out with a modern-day 14-year-old in Melbourne, Australia. Who is Tim Ryan, and what is his life like? before he comes to Flinders Island? Well, let's, let's start about talking about Melbourne. You know, one of the things that struck me years ago when I, I first went across from South Africa to Chicago, which was my introduction to America, which is a bit of a shock, was not how different it was, but how similar large cities in the Western world are. And if you want to know what Melbourne is like, Look at any large city in the U.S. That is more or less the kind of environment you're talking about, the type of people you're talking about, the lifestyle you're talking about. It happens to be set in Australia, which is a fairly wealthy country. But, yeah, you could be anywhere in the U.S., large city. Um, the fact that it happens to be next to the, the coast makes almost no difference because most, for most people they are city dwellers and they don't actually see much of that coast. Tim's a 14-year-old who doesn't fit in terribly well to the environment he's in. Now, I remember being 14 and not fitting in terribly well to the environment I was in. I'm pretty sure, Tony, you remember being 14 and not fitting in very well. I think it's the thing that a lot of 14-year-olds go through. But in Tim's case, there are actually a few more reasons than just being 14, but that adds to it. Tim has a complicated genetic heritage, which um, adds complications to his life, shall we say. He's unhappy. He's kind of a fish out of water, metaf metaphysically even, yes. which perhaps but we were, but <laughs> he really is. You know, there's, there's a lot about um, Tim that he is not aware of at first, in himself, for instance, the fact that he's the confluence of two powerful magical inheritances. And this attracts a certain supernatural being to him. Can you tell us more about Ed? Is it Ed and his kind? Right. Ed, actually, yeah. Um, he's, Ed is one of the creatures of light and darkness. I don't know if, if you're familiar with Yates. Mm -hmm. Yeah, everyone should, should have Yates somewhere down in their lives. It's like Kipling. But the fairy host are a very hierarchical group. And among the lower sort of echelons thereof are, are these poor little goblin-like gnomes who are tasked with most of the hard work and, in theory, changelings, when they come of age, acquire a fairy helper of some sort to help them to return to fairy, and Ed is not easily visible to ordinary people, but will follow his master around and does his best without ever understanding quite what his master's doing 
to help. Help, if you can imagine a large, intelligent dog trying to help you, sometimes the results can be similar to Ed's attempt to help. And he gets Tim in trouble, and uh, Tim's mother ships him off to uh, Flinders at, uh, in our first chapter there, which is not yeah. a spoiler because we, we see it on the flap. <laughs> well, put it this way. It's a spoiler which actually has a, a place in, in reality quite a lot. Quite a lot of kids do end up being sent off to the islands, etc., to get them away from the cities. And strangely enough, generally speaking, it seems to work. Mm -hmm. I mean, every now and again, there's a kid that just doesn't respond to the place and to the environment. And, yeah, well, then they'll have to go back to wherever they came from. But so many kids have come here and straightened their lives out that I think that maybe there is really something missing in, in that urban environment. Maybe this is something that kids need to get in touch with. Yeah. Or maybe there's something there that you just can't find anywhere else. <laughs> Oh, I don't think so. I think that small urban communities have a lot in common. Oh, small rural communities have a lot in common. Mm. But yes, I mean, we're extremely isolated, so that changes the dynamics a bit. Well, let's uh, let's skip ahead and talk about Flinders, just because... What do you mean you're isolated? How would you describe your isolation? Well, you know, I, I live in fairy lands, or fairy lands, or fairy lands, in interesting sense that to get here other than by flying is a 10-hour ferry trip. That's the short way. The long way is about two days. Um, and the ferry only comes once a week. And they had a ferry strike or breakdown type situation a, a while back. And the ferry didn't come in for four months. Um, anything that came in either had to come by aeroplane, or you had to produce it yourself. Uh, we do have a, a flight in every day, but it's a, a turboprop plane. Um, when I came to the island the first time, they were still using a six-seater, and you got to sit, and sit next to the pilot when you flew over. Now we've, we've moved up. We've got an 18-seater now. Sometimes it's actually got 18 passengers. The island is well, more or less 70 miles away from mainland Australia, but it's in the Bass Strait, which is one of the more turbulent bits of sea in the world, principally because it's so shallow. It was originally a land bridge, and so, of course, you've got the whole of the force of the southern oceans hitting this land bridge, and that peaks the waves up enormously, and we're also in the roaring 40s, so you get huge amounts of wind. Um, this was a, a passage which a lot of the ships coming from Europe took um, past Australia because it had the roaring 40s. You've got a good wind, and unfortunately it also has lots of rocks and scratches left over from when the land bridge had mountains on it. And that is really what Flinders is. It's a leftover chain of mountains in the sea. It's, it's a drowned mountain chain. Um, there are 52 islands. Flinders is merely the, the biggest of those. And there are these little granite outcrops absolutely in the middle of nowhere. You can feel as if the rest of the world really doesn't exist around you. Do people it's, live on, the, on separate islands, or does everybody live on the Flinders portion? Nowadays, um, most of them live on the Flinders portion. There are a couple of the small islands that are still populated. But when the islands were first colonized, um, there was no, nobody living here at all. Um, there had been an Aboriginal population when the land bridge existed, and they'd been cut off by the rising sea, and eventually, with the dropping temperatures and things like that, and a small population, I reckon about 3,000 years ago, the last Aboriginals on Flinders died out. Um, of course... There were still part of the same Aboriginal group living on Tasmania. That's the other really fascinating thing about this place, is that Tasmania can see Flinders quite clearly. It's only about um, 40 miles away, so as soon as you're up a little bit, you can actually see it. 
And you can see these green islands out there in the sea. And of course, given the conditions, you've heard of those, the islands of the dead, which the, the Irish believed in, that they could occasionally see across the distance in the sea. Mm-hmm. Um, Magmel, the Isles of the Blessed, etc. That was the Aboriginal myth about Flinders, because everywhere on Tasmania, Aboriginal groups would watch for other Aboriginal groups so that they would raid to and fro. It was very much a, a primitive hunter-gatherer society, and there was quite a lot of intertribal raiding and feuding and whatever, as there, I suppose, always is. Um, and they could see where any other group lived by the smoke plumes from their fires. But the one thing they could see were these green islands and no smoke. So they believed these were the Isles of the Dead. This is where you went to after you died. It's kind of both... And that, that in fact, is part of the basis of the whole story that I wrote. You said, you know, these are the mythical Isles of the Dead. It's got this, well, for an island, large mountain that comes up from sea level to about 3,000 feet. <laughs> so... Um, that's pretty steep in it's, that amount of room. It's pretty steep, and you can see it from a long way off, and they could see this island, and yeah, that's where they thought that that if you were going to die, you, you went to Flinders. And of course, one of the tie-ins there is that this place was populated, an Aboriginal population did live here, and some of those relations, distant though they may be, would still go on living in Tasmania. Hmm. So if you were good, you went to Flinders, but if you were bad, you had to go to Melbourne? <laughs> I don't think they, they defined good and bad quite as much as we did. Okay. Well, um, so, uh, uh, we, don't, we don't really know. There's, there's not enough left of that culture yeah. to, to track it down. Um, the history of Tasmania is pretty tragic. It makes... You know, it was the, where the worst convicts were sent, which explains why they sent me here. Um, but, yeah, they, they had conflict between the settlers and the Aboriginal population, and they had something called the Black Line, and they actually literally tried to make a line across the country and herd all the Aboriginal people along and either kill them or capture them. Yeah, um, so Flinders was, in fact, one of the places they took people to as a refuge, um, which didn't work very well. They, Aboriginal culture has a strong sense of place, mm-hmm. and men do not move to, to a new area. You know, um, you have a, a very strong tie with, if I get it right, where your mother had her um, first trimester, when she was three months pregnant, that's where you are rooted. So, And that kind of ties into what I I made. Tim having had come over to the island before he was born. So he's tied to the island in that way. Yeah. So in actuality, Aboriginals were resettled on Flinders in the historical past, like, what, the 70s? The history of, of the settlement here is that one of the very early explorers, Matthew Flinders, came sailing down the coast of Australia in this very tiny boat to go and try and check out whether there was a passage between Tasmania and the mainland, because they were at that stage they still thought Tasmania might be part of the mainland. And how oh, this, this guy in this, what was basically a sort of 40-foot whaleboat um, managed to survive the sea around here is a tribute to his seamanship or his luck, one of the two. But anyway, at that stage, he noticed huge populations of seals living on the islands. And seals, seal skin was, of course, a very much sought-after fur in Europe. So the first settlers here were, in fact, your sealers who came. Most of them who actually survived and, and succeeded were, in fact, uh, from 
either Irish or Scottish islands, so they could adapt to the life here quite easily because it wasn't that wildly dissimilar. So they settled here, and they took Aboriginal wives, either mostly from Tasmania, but a few of them from um, Australia itself. And that is the, the Aboriginal stock on Flinders. They actually formed what was for a while known as a, a distinct group called the Straits Men. And they lived their own lives, principally on the outer islands, not living on, on Flinders itself. But for a simple reason, Flinders was just one big solid forest. Um, whereas the outer islands, the birds that come in um, destroy the trees. So you've actually got grazing for, for livestock. And the birds that come in are particularly the short, short-tailed shearwaters, uh, the mutton birds, which um, lay their eggs down, these, a single egg down, down the burrow, and then feed the chick enormously when it hatches, and then fly off for a week or so at a time. So the chick has to have loads and loads of fat to survive. And it was that fat and those chicks that enabled the original settlers to survive. Um, so mutton birding is very much part of the Aboriginal tradition and very much part of, of the original sealer tradition. And, of course, it's something they also used to do with a similar type of bird in, in the European island, well, the islands of Scotland and, and um, Ireland. So a lot of the Scottish and Irish myths got transposed, yeah, because it was a very natural fit and it was the same kind of people, same sort of environment, which I tried to push through in the book. So you're kind of in so a unique uh, unique place where Celtic myth and Aboriginal uh, beliefs met. Yes. And actually didn't fight too badly about it, <laughs> um, because both sides benefited quite a lot from each other. Um, the British, this was one of the most lawless last frontiers in, in, in Australia. And the British occasionally came around and tried to resettle these women that um, had been taken as wives. or Some, some of them were bought. And there are several recorded instances of, of the women returning to their sila husbands. Yeah, and by the next generation, they all seem to have settled into to living quite contentedly together. But that's how the islands got populated, and um, yeah, there's still quite a lot of the original settlers from that time. The families go on, go all the way back to them. Some descendants of them in the story would be for Tim, uh, Tim's grandmother, Mary Tim's Ryan. Tim's grandmother, yep, yeah. and. What I tried to do there is try to show how the, the island is, is so intertangled. It's almost, you've got to be really careful about insulting anyone on this place because guaranteed everybody is either friends with that person or related to that person. And even if they hate him, you can't insult him. <laughs> <laughs> you get the, you know, they'll all jump on you because you've said something nasty about so-and-so. Yeah, it's um, both both sides of Tim's family, in fact, are the original settlers to the islands. Well, tell us more about Mary's character, because this is the woman that Tim finds himself living with out of the blue. Mm. Yes, well, Australia also had you know, racial issues just much much as South Africa or, in fact, um, the U.S. did. And there was there was a fairly strong line between black and white families, although, to be realistic, on the islands, how did you tell very often? And there was some cross-marriage, and of course, both sides resented it quite badly. And Mary married one of the guys who went off to go and fight in Vietnam. The islands have an interesting history in that per capita huge numbers of of the men from here have, have always volunteered for every conflict. Um, 
you know, you look at how few people there are, and and they've just given far more than everybody else. And yes, um, we've we've got a very strong return servicemen's league here, and yes, he he was missing in action, and she, partly because of of the racial background and partly because of having lost her husband, literally isolated herself and, and trapped herself as living back in that past. So the boy has a lot to bridge both with coming to terms with her and the way she lives and the environment he's been dropped into. She she raises uh, cows and sheep, right? And Yeah, that's what we do here. Um, the island is, what, 70 miles by about 20 miles wide, and we've got 700 people and we've got about 700,000 cows. <laughs> yeah. um, good cattle grazing country, and it's fairly good sheep country as well. Um, it is pretty um, much rough grazing. I suppose best comparison would be somewhere like South Dakota or something like that. I don't know. I'm, I'm not expert enough on on the U.S. to say, but that that type of of farming. So um, Tim most, has never, most, needless to say, Tim has never milked a cow or caught a sheep before he comes. And yeah, catching sheep. Um, my original sort of role model for what Tim was to become was one of the farmers here's kids actually catching a sheep to to deal with fly strike. Because um, we've got these nasty flesh-eating flies here, and any wound or patch of dirt or anything like that on on a sheep will attract um, these. These flies will lay eggs in that, and the, the flies will then actually burrow into the flesh of of the sheep. And it's it's a treatable problem, but you actually have to physically catch and treat the sheep, which. <laughs> It was quite an education when you see, see a sort of sturdy 10-year-old um, crash tackling a sheep to catch it. Yeah. Anyway. Well, that's, yeah, that's a, um, there's a great scene. It's quite an education, scene. I think, for, for anyone to, to have to deal with these things. After he learns how to do it, there's a great scene where, um, where his friend Molly watches him do it, and she's completely grossed out by the, by the what is it called again? Yeah. Um, it's a bow fly. It's, you know, it's called fly strike. Fly strike. Yeah. Yeah. It is really a nasty thing to see, and the sheep are very much better off for being caught. But being sheep, they don't like being caught. There's another um, fairy creature, and this one hangs out with with Mary, uh, the grandmother. It's a fenadry. What what is that? Right, the fenadry, um, another Celtic island. Um, fairy creature and I mean after all I must be about as close as you get to a fenadry because they're short, hairy don't say an awful lot and like doing agricultural things Hmm that might also describe certain hobbits but anyway that's... <laughs> Yeah, they're not un- unhobbit like except that um, they're, they're extremely tied to agriculture and the land you know so they're, they're more a spirit of place than of familiar with a person. Mary's aware of it, and she's aware of um, Tim's mm. spirit, guardian, whatever aid is, right? Yeah. Well, Tim actually eventually begins to, to catch sight of it himself. But what I was playing on is that you don't really see what you don't believe yeah. you can see. Yeah. He convinces yeah, um, himself everything that happens something else caused it because he yeah. just yeah and i mean isn't isn't that human nature i mean <laughs> you you look something straight in the face and say oh well there must be a logical reason for this which i haven't thought of rather than the simple and obvious cause of, of it yeah his coming to understand that he's got aid and um the whole thing is a coming of age story for tim He's kind of an ineffective, a little bit whiny kid at the beginning of the story, truthfully. And But he doesn't stay that way through the book. He really... That's what I loved about the book is that, you know, in a lot of YAs, 
the the main character doesn't really develop. They say they do, um, but but Tim really becomes another person when he gets to Flinders. Well, I mean, I, I I remember being fourteen. I was an obnoxious brat, um, and I do think that people do grow and change. But I do think if you you give somebody the opportunity to do so, and the place where they can succeed, it often changes them enormously. Yeah, you know? it's one of the things I've I've kind of done with with my young cousins and whatever is we take take them out for a couple of days with nothing but a knife. And you actually have to live off the land and I show them all the ways of catching and where the food is and how to make shelter and things like that. And it's interesting just even in a few short days like that, how kids come into themselves and how they learn, how they grasp all these things. That's why I'm very keen on organizations like the Scouts and so on, trying to do it in a somewhat more formal way. But, you know, most of, most of what I learned, I picked up from my dad. And we're just trying to pass all the old ways down because you know, he picked up a lot of it um, from his father or, and also from playing with the, the native herd boys up in the Suja land. And... Um, where they, these kids would be sent off at sort of eight to ten years old with a sack of maize meal, and that was it. They would have to spend three three months living up in the mountains on whatever they could catch, and the maize meal is a kind of fallback. And this is what my dad did growing up, and so, um, yeah, he taught me a lot of these skills. I try and pass them on, and I try and write about them in the book. That's that's really cool. Well, it's, Tim has a mentor who I kind of pictured as you in, <laughs> in John McKay. Yeah, jo- John I based on, um, actually on the guy who gave me the idea for the whole story. Um, one of the abalone divers. Um, abalone diving, it's very lucrative, but my God, it's one of the hardest jobs that you can imagine. Um, they basically... Um, go and gather by hand um, the abalone while the boat tracks them behind and then they float the stuff up to the boat. And they'll, they'll collect three or four tons of abalone at, at, in a dive. Um, it's really scary, challenging, hard work. Um, but the thing about this is you meet these guys and they, they take it so much as a, as a a normal part of life. I mean, I've tried it. I've, I've been down. I've um, worked on the boat. Um, I've done exactly what Tim did. Um, and it's it's a huge challenge. And this is the thing about these guys. They're doing that sort of thing every day. You don't view it as a challenge, but my word, those are men. Hmm. And John is a good guy very good guy and he he serves as sort of mentor to Tim in the story. Yeah, I, he provides a bit of a father figure, I think. Yeah. And the by the way the 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 abalone divers use air pumped into a mask yeah. through a through a like they, they use a thing called a hooker, which is basically if you take a normal aqualung that's got a first and second stage regulator, one stage coming out of your tank and the other stage going into your mouth. All this does is, is to take the tank phase and put it onto the boat and then to run a tube all the way down to the diver so that the diver cannot actually run out of air while the compressor on the boat is going. Or um, basically the compressor runs into tanks on the boat and the, the um even if the compressor stops, there's still some air in the tank, so the guy who's running the boat can call the diver back to the surface by yanking on his hoses. Um, that's what I was doing yesterday. Yeah, you do a lot of that, don't you? Yeah, well, that's, um, I set out when we came here to, to try and be as self-sufficient as possible. 
So we either shoot or grow or harvest from the wild all our own food, barring the essential food groups like coffee and chocolate. Because, I mean, there's some things that a man, you know, really just has to accept that he's got to have. Indeed. Um, but yes, um, you know, we, I smoke our own bacon, grow our own pigs. Um, we shoot wallaby a lot. Uh, I, so I do a lot of stalking. and It's not... I, I don't really know how to explain this. I'm not a hunter. I, I'm, uh, you know, I don't do it for pleasure particularly. It's, it's just part of life. Um, I will t- take a rifle out when we need um, more meat and, and go and shoot a wallaby. Wallaby stew, take, or do you just eat it sorry? as a? Sorry. Do you eat What's it as that? a? Do you make a stew out of it, or do you just eat it as a? Um, well, there are two two different kinds of of wallaby. The one is extremely gamey, and those, you know, you have to do some heavy disguise. But the other one is quite a mild meat, um, somewhere between beef and 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 mutton. So, yeah, we we make steaks out of it. We um, do it. We fry it. We do almost everything. Make mince out of it. Any any kind of um, dish that you would involve mincing is, is probably going to be minced wallaby. But what you do when you go diving is you're spear fishing, right? Or yeah, I use a hand a hand spear, um, which is sort of one step below a, a Hawaiian sling. It's it's basically it's got a rubber thing to accelerate the, the stroke. But basically, I'm using a spear like anyone used to use a spear back in history. So, and Tim is learning how to fish and do a lot of the things that you do regularly. And, and it's just yeah. like suddenly being thrown into a boy's paradise, even though he doesn't realize he's been in fights against it actively until he finally uh, comes around. So, some of the uh, um, uh, obstacles... Um, it, yeah. Go ahead. Uh, no, sorry, you say? I was trying to follow you. There are obstacles thrown in uh, Tim's path, of course, and one of those is this nasty selkie that's hanging around. Tell us about her. Uh, yes, she's one of my, my my favorite kind of characters that recurs in, in many of my books. Um, she's not nasty per se, as simply totally amoral. Um, she's got a job to do, and she doesn't care if she kills Tim to get her job done. She's honorable in the sense that if she makes a bargain, she will keep it. But she has no feelings whatsoever. Um, and that in it, itself is is almost more frightening than somebody who's, who's evil or nasty or something like that. She just doesn't care. She will cheerfully drown or kill somebody to achieve what she has to achieve and she herself is an ancient creature bound by magic to do the task that she has to do and and she's trying the one to... thing that, that is stopping her is that she can't actually get onto the land to get to the boy because the spirits of the land are pushing her away she's trying to get stolen key to um to the fairy underground right yeah. that's her that's um, right yeah things. I, I kind of, well, there's a nice short story up on Bain explaining all about the key. Yeah, I was about to say, uh, what's the title of that again? The Changeling and the Puka, I think it is. Yeah. And I, I've, you can find yeah. it on Bain.com right now, and you can find it forever in the ebook collection, uh, Short Stories 2016, which is on uh, the Bain ebook site. Anyway, go ahead, yes. Yeah, because I mean, the whole point with the key is that the key will actually let is the key is Tim's birthright because he as a changeling is half human half fairy in original descent obviously there's there's been a lot of time elapsed and a lot of generations between that but the key would let him into the fairy mound into the fairy idea of paradise um, the limitless green fields and the 
endless fun and the hunting and whatever, where there is no time and there is no death. I'll, I'll leave other people to talk about the metaphysics of that sometime. Thomas the Rhymer did it pretty well. Well, there's also, on the more mundane side, there's the nasty, shallow uh, Haley Burke. And she, she gets Tim in trouble at the beginning, and she hasn't gone, in, gone away um, entirely at all from... And has Tim got... Yeah, she's a piece of work, isn't she? Yeah, I, she's a, I like her. <laughs> <Thank you. laughs> the way she treats yeah. her nephews and nieces. And... I, the, the less I say about Haley, the better, except that she is a nasty piece of work. But, yeah, how, how many of, of us, especially at that sort of age, uh, didn't look much past, past the um, physical attractions? Yeah, she's very cute. And Tim had a thing for her in Melbourne, and he's still... Mm. And, but then there's yeah. Molly. Uh, Tell us a little if, bit more. If I talk too much about that, I'll definitely be, be going into spoilers. Yeah, yeah. Why don't you ask me about dogs instead? Well, let's talk about Molly and Bunce. <laughs> yeah. Well, Bunce, Bunce is um, an Irish wolfhound. And there's an Irish wolfhound on, on the island, which I kind of used as a role model. And they are one of the most friendly and affectionate of dogs. But there's an awful lot of dog. <laughs> a huge amount of dog. And, of course, they were considered the nobility of dogs in Ireland, which is why um, Ed re- re- refers to him as, as a noble coo, which is a nice play on noble cow because he's about the same size. Um, and Tim and, uh, um, and Molly start off on the aeroplane with her being very nervous and him not being in the least attracted to her but being friendly. And you kind of often see this in real life. Um, a couple of people who, who really suit each other very well and neither of them actually noticing the other one's alive. That's a story about how, how that changes and how that develops. So Molly is, um, is she, her parents run a bed and breakfast in, yeah. on the island. and she's, That's one of the things about the island is that because it's, it tends to attract a specific kind of people. Uh, in other words, the sort of people who don't mind living 10 hours ferry trip from the mainland. But um, we have a a fair number of what we call sea changes, people who come and give up their city life and come and live next to the coast and try and live a fit into the island way of life. Some of them manage it well and some of them don't. There is, a, is there enough tourists? Uh, I mean, is that one of the big um, economic uh, Yeah, um, activities? other than livestock, that's our probably next next biggest thing. The trouble is it's very expensive getting here. Um, costs you around $400 to fly in from Melbourne. Um, and, yeah, I think it's about 350 from from Launceston. So, no, if you're on the island, unless you're extremely well off, you don't leave very often. Most people go for a couple of times a year. Uh, people... There are people who haven't left for 20 years. It does make them have an interesting picture of the rest of the world, especially when they have to drive in, in other cities. <laughs> There's people that haven't Actually, left in 50 one of the, years. One of the things about this place is it's impossible to drive anywhere without greeting everybody. And it's literally a case of if you don't greet someone, they'll take out their mobile and phone you and say, are you all right? <laughs> um, you know, so we, 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 of course, after being here for a couple of years, went across to Melbourne and um, promptly greeting every motorist that we saw, and there were quite a lot of them. <laughs> we nearly <laughs> caused several traffic accidents because everyone's trying to work out who this friend of theirs was <laughs> trying to greet. Yeah, well, that's the problem uh, also with Southerners and Northerners in the U.S. A lot of um, Southerners, off, except in the big cities, they they often wave to each other or put the one finger up as the thing, you know. Yeah, it's it's called the Flinders Wave around here. Mm-hmm. Two fingers come up, up off the steering wheel usually. 
People think you're quite well, odd. Be carefully you... joined together two fingers. Yeah, you got to be careful which finger you use. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, the case, pick a finger. Yeah. Yep. So, so uh, you know, I mentioned how much well, I really loved the book when I first read it. Um, what's the origin story? What got you thinking you wanted to write this book? Well, <laughs> I mean, you've said some of that. You know, one, one of the big problems here is, is that many of the Aboriginal people feel a loss of value, like they're second-class citizens and so on. And one of my Aboriginal friends and one of the guys who, who dies was, was telling me the story about how somebody used, one of the Aboriginal boatmen who used to work for the ad divers, used to na navigate his way out to the islands, blind drunk, um, in heavy mist. And managed to get them safe and sound there every time. And I, I got to thinking back on my own background, how with the um, Bushman trackers back in South Africa, and asking them how they knew what they were following and trying to understand the whole sort of process of tracking because, you know, I was interested in, in game tracking and things like that. And so much of it was... <laughs> They would explain bits and pieces. They saw this, they saw that. But so much of it was actually being able to get themselves into a, a mindset with the animal they were following. And so much of it was also almost instinctive. They, they, they knew how to think like that. Um, they seemed to have enormous peripheral vision. They seemed to, to be aware of, of things going on around the edges of themselves that I just didn't see. And I got to thinking about this and thinking how if you've lived off the land for, what, they're putting the date of Aboriginal settlement here as, as 30,000 years or 40,000 years back, there's got to be a very strong bond to the land, to living off the land, to picking up the cues from that land. And that should be something to be incredibly proud of that should be a, a strength in people. And, yeah, that was what I wrote about, is just how being able to relate to the land and being able to not so much live off it, but to live with it is a vital part of of being a rural, well, rural person, never mind Australian, but rural Australian specifically. Well, and it, in, in Changeling Island, it turns you in from a, turns you from a whiny 14-year-old into a really uh, appealing and resourceful young guy by allowing yeah. the, the land to work on you or the magic that uh, is within you to... to stop. Well, I think it's basically that part of... I think all of us have it to some extent, but you know, letting, letting that part of you get in, in touch with the environment you're in and, and actually responding to it is, can, can make or break you. And, yeah, there's the reality. In Tim's case, I was writing a good story about how it, it made someone. But I also think you've got Tim's dad who it broke. Mm -hmm. he, he couldn't handle it and, you know, escaped from it and ran away from it. And that's part of the issue with Tim is that he, he lacks a father figure and he lacks, you know, that le the lessons in how to deal with the real environment. Yeah. So, um, beyond Changeling Island, what uh, what are you working on these days, Dave? Um, well, I'm heading towards being finished with the next Curry's one. And then what I write after that kind of depends on whether Eric's finished editing the book I've sent to him, which is, is part of the, the uh, Heirs of Alexandria series. Other than that, I have a... <laughs> couple of books that I'll work on if that's not ready. Um, I was hoping to do either one set on a world. I, I got this idea of the habitable zone on, on any planet being where people could live, not necessarily being the entire planet. So, for instance, on a gas giant, there is a, a zone high up enough in the atmosphere where the pressure is such that the air would be breathable. 
so long as it was a, a gas mixture that you could breathe. So I was thinking of writing a world which had no land at all, just was purely airborne. Mm. Um, and, yeah, that, that, that was my one sort of science fiction concept that I was fiddling with. Well, that um, sounds pretty super. I, I wanted to write a um, Regency sort of fantasy just to prove that I could, because I like doing that kind of thing. Um, and basically, I thought it would shock Tony. Yeah, you're a big uh, Georgette Heyer fan, I know. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Heyer taught me a lot about um, how to write dialogue. Well, you put it to good use in Changelings Island. Uh, the book is Changelings Island. It's at booksellers everywhere. You will find it among the science fiction and fantasy on the young adult shelves of your bookstore, the teen section in the Barnes & Nobles. Of course, you can order it online in various ways as well and get it uh, any way you can because it's really a, a really excellent book. Dave, thank you so much for being with us. Well, my pleasure. Now we continue with our complete audiobook serialization of John Ringo's Under a Graveyard Sky. This portion of Under a Graveyard Sky is provided by Audible.com. Get the complete audiobook at Audible.com now. If you're not a subscriber, you can get the entire audiobook free or choose from more than 100,000 other titles when you try Audible free for 30 days. Now here is another segment of John Ringo's novel, of zombie infestation and the heroic humans who fight back, determined to pull the world from disaster and humanity itself from the brink of annihilation. It's all taking place under a graveyard sky. Chapter 29 Dibs on direct commission. Lieutenant Colonel Justin Pierre had been missing meetings due to a reoccurrence of, of all things, malaria. He'd picked it up in Afghanistan. Doctors at Walter Reed thought they'd gotten out every trace with a new drug regime, but it turned out they were, well, wrong. Which hadn't been spotted before he was put on this assignment, or he'd never have had it. In fact, malaria was now one of those things that were grounds for medical retirement, or, possibly, a letter of reprimand, since you were supposed to take prophylaxis medication. Colonel Pierre had not been lax in his use of prophylaxis medication. He had ended up way in the back of nowhere and cut off for about 30 days until he could E&E to friendly lines. Unlike the SEALs, who had ended up in a similar situation, his team had never made the news, probably because he had managed to extract all of them without any deaths. Wounded, yes, but they had an 18 Delta with them. Regular medics and corpsmen were trained to stabilize a patient until they could be evacuated. Special forces medics were trained to heal people. They admitted they were not doctors, nor anywhere close, but Sergeant Ford had gone above and beyond. However, they were planning a seven-day mission, not 30. All of them had gotten malaria. But he was back in the saddle and determined to get that girl as a commissioned officer in the United States Army. I'll throw in submitting a memo for record to the CJCS that they waive normal restrictions against women attending advanced combat schools. Set up a quickie Q course and automatically pass her. She's 13, Colonel, Bryce said dryly. I think the youngest officer the U.S. Army has ever commissioned was 15, Pierre said. I can gin up a recommendation to the Joint Chiefs that, given current global conditions, we can waiver some people. That's a lot of waivers, Colonel, Freeman said. Besides, I think all things considered, she's more the SEAL type. Got any available SEAL instructors? Pierre said. I'm a qualified Q-Course instructor. Actually, I was thinking Marines, Mr. Galloway said. Colonel Ellington? I now have a better appreciation for your paladin in hell metaphor. Galloway looked over at Ellington and saw that the colonel's face was covered in tears. Colonel, Galloway said carefully. She reminds me of my wife, sir, the colonel said. She was a lieutenant in the MPs when we met. I am, Galloway said. 
There is an unspoken rule against speaking about family, at least in these sort of circumstances. Sorry, I hope I have the opportunity to meet her someday. That would be difficult, sir, Ellington said. She was killed in Iraq, long before this debacle. Suicide bomber. I was standing about ten feet from her, facing her, sir. They picked parts of her out of my face at Walter Reed, sir. He pointed to an odd bump on his face. Then again, parts of her are still with me, sir. They believe it is a portion of a tooth. My wife had beautiful teeth. Holy fuck, Ellington, Bryce whispered. That wasn't in your service report. Just that you'd been hit by an IED in Iraq. That was personal rather than professional, Ellington said with a shrug. She essentially shielded me from the blast. I survived. She did not. It was tough, but we'd arranged to be on the same team, doing analysis of the Iraqi WMD program. She was commanding the security team. She was always... His face tightened, and he breathed hard. I am a Marine officer. I am versed in combat. But she was the warrior, sir. General. I was, am, a geek. I can fight. I have proven that. I have direct combat action in Iraq, but she was the warrior of us, Mr. Undersecretary, General Bryce. She was our warrior half. Colonel Pierre, my wife was an army officer. I would not prevent that young lady's career in the Marines in any way. She would make a fine Marine. I would also not be upset if she chose the army. Some Marines might, but I have known the warrior women of the army, and they are fine warriors. Honorable and courageous warriors, all. Thank you, Colonel, Pierre said. I wish I had met her in my career. Mr. Undersecretary, a serious suggestion? Yes, Galloway said. I would recommend that a recording of this be downloaded to all the still-in-contact submarines, Pierre said. There is damned little, currently, to build morale. Perhaps put it together with earlier bits, such as Miss Smith's response to her father's question about backup plans. That, Colonel, is a really sensible suggestion, Galloway said. Commander, can we do that, bandwidth-wise? Not an issue, sir, Freeman said. And yes, I'd agree, it's an excellent idea. It sure as hell raised my morale. Let's hope her father is as heartened, General Bryce said. I'm betting he hits the roof. You okay, Faith? Steve said, clearing the landing ladder. You couldn't walk on the deck for all the bodies. He literally had to jump into an open rib cage to get off the ladder. When he'd gotten into contact with Sophia, she'd been really noncommittal about how things were going. Faith's still there. No bites. Now he knew why. No worries, da, Faith said, shrugging. She was absolutely covered in blood. Fair dinkum scrum. Who channeled it just fine? Hacienic's gear, while blood splattered, was splattered, not covered. For that matter, parts of Faith's heavy battle gear were torn. There were teeth marks everywhere, and she had some knives missing from their sheaths. And her machete was on the deck, bent, and her halligan tool had matted brain matter and hair on it. It was long and blonde, and for a second, Steve wondered if she'd somehow ripped some of her own hair out with it except hers was thoroughly covered by her gear. Trixie got a little messed up, Faith said, reaching back to pat the teddy bear. Trixie's gonna need a nice hot bath after this, isn't she? Trixie says she got a little frightened, but she'll be okay. She shut her eyes during the bad parts. Steve had seen enough zombies dead from wounds at this point for a 20-year career, and he knew wounds, even before this apocalypse. Zombies were cut. Smashed, bashed in heads. All the shot wounds had speckling around them from close or direct contact shots. Angles were insane on some of them. Shots down into the shoulder, which could only be done from... Okay, he said. No worries. Thanks for holding the high ground. You need to take a breather for a bit? What I need to do is ammo up, Faith said. But I think most of my mags are so... 
messed up that they sort of need to be cleaned first. And I'm down to less than one mag of Saiga. Pistol? Steve asked. Uh, I'm down to three rounds. I think that Fontana and I will hold this position while you go wash down your gear and ammo back up. Can you keep going? Seriously? Try to hold me back, dear. That was another segment in our complete audiobook serialization of Under a Graveyard Sky by John Ringo. And that's it for the podcast. Thanks to Audible.com, to Christopher Rocchio, Rachel Mintel, and to podcast theme composer Ruth Judkowitz. And a year's supply of wallaby jerky plucked from God's meat locker at the end of the universe, where everything has had time to cure to perfection, plus a blossom of iridescent plankton to light his way to our thanks and praise for Dave Freer, author of Changeling's Island. Please join us next time here at the hammering heart of science fiction and fantasy, and keep reaching for the stars. The Bain Free Radio Hour is brought to you by Bain Books Audio Drama, presenting dramatized audio plays of the best science fiction and fantasy with a professional cast and cinema quality soundtracks. Now available, Eric Flint's Islands, based on the novella by Eric Flint. Also available, Larry Correa's Detroit Christmas, based on the novella by Larry Correa, set in the world of the Grim Noir Chronicles at BaneEbooks.com. Just put Islands and Detroit Christmas in the search bar and enter a world of listening pleasure. Bane Books Audio Drama. Thank you.